I used to do years and years ago before stabilizing my career and starting off with the park service, I used to be a DJ uh, <laughs> in one of those little 500-watt uh, shoebox radio stations in East Tennessee. And my boss used to beat on my shoulders and say, don't start late, but don't start early. Start right up there on time. So I'm going to endeavor to do that. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is to try and orient everybody right off the bat as to where we are on the battlefield and the place in the rest of the story. We are on Southern Seminary Ridge and what we're going to be dealing with today is a look at the specific portion of the artillery and how it plays into the role of the attack on the Peach Orchard on the second day of July, 1862, 1863, but the second day of the battle. And uh, by doing that, I want to have us take a little bit of a look at technology and terrain as we get into the story of that. Technology, terrain, and command are all going to be a part of what's going to uh, knit everything together on the second day of July out here. So as we look a little bit off to the west out here, and we are eventually going to cross the road here but just a bit. But you're looking out to the mountains off to the west from which the Confederate Army approaches this position. The 75,000 men of the Confederate Army will approach from Chambersburg coming in this direction, coming in bits and pieces. Everybody does not arrive here all at once. And as they come up this way, elevation is going to be key because elevation will be security. When folks come and claim higher ground, obviously they have no U2s, they have no Telstars, they have no spy satellites, but if you get on the higher ground, you can see what's coming at you from different places. And as the men of Longstreet's Corps, the two divisions that are going to be key in making the assault on the 2nd of July, will be known to be on the high ground to the southeast of the battlefield, a uh, little round top possibly. Uh, they are concerned that anything that approaches will give away what's going on in terms of setting up the attack. So Longstreet will wind up having to make his uh, nefarious counter march back and forth to try and keep his line uh, somewhat a secret in terms of where it's eventually going. So what I want to do is take a look over in this position uh, on the far side. So we're going to make sure we're not going to get stuck by any vehicles over here. Now as we look into the view below, you're going to see that as the competitors coming up this way, they will definitely think that Seminary Ridge is high ground. Of course it's not as high as Cemetery Ridge beyond it, and we all know that from our studies and reviews of the battlefield out here. But as they come up this way, they will finally think that after that march and counter march and concern about the vision of Big Round Top off in the distance, they will finally think that they will be able to deploy back in this direction and move the two divisions of uh, General Hood and General McClaws back in this direction and finally begin to send them off in that direction so that they will be able to outflank the federal position based on the information they've got. Now how this all ties into artillery is that Confederate artillery is laid out in the Confederate Army in the division arrangement. About 16 guns, usually about four batteries, that are strung out per division in the Confederate Army. And so that is how everything is going to be attached, and so that is how everything is going to follow. However, the fellow that is going to be the default commander for the Confederate artillery under James Longstreet is a fellow that's going to be fairly familiar to a number of you, a fellow by the name of Edward Porter Alexander. Edward Porter Alexander, however, is not on paper, according to the food chain, the fellow that is the artillery chief for the First Corps, for Longstreet's Corps. He is a fellow by the name of James Burge Walton. Walton is the fellow directly underneath the uh, uh, fellow that commands all of the Confederate artillery, which we're not going to get into right now, but that's Pendleton. But at any rate, the reason that they're getting ready to do this is because Walton is an older gentleman 
not that sharp uh, with the Sabre, better with the briefcase as far as organization and things like that. Uh, one of those cases of uh, the uh, senile overtaking the superior, and that's the case. So they will go and tell the uh, recent graduate from West Point, the late 1850s, that he is actually the guy that's going to be the operational chief for the upcoming battle. Uh, late 1850s graduate of West Point and the fellow that they trust has the uh, with it the youth uh, and the technical experience so he's going to be the fellow that's going to kind of keep an operational eye on what's going to go on now since there are about 18 guns in each of these divisions you're going to have approximately 56 guns in all of the particulars that are going to be facing the Federals when the attack is actually positioned and made ready to go after now, of course, when they get up here, what they're actually going to find is different than the information that they were told in the morning because of the fact that Sickles will advance from his position and project out into the wheat field. So this is what we're going into the uh, peach orchard gather. So this is what we're going to get. Now, that's a little bit of the background historical structure. Now, as far as the technical aspects of it go, we're going to see a couple of different things out here as well. And I want to get into some of it. First off, if you look over to your left, remember artillery in this area is all direct fire weapons. You know, uh, depending on what kind of gun it is, you're going to be able to hit something about a mile, maybe a mile and a quarter, something like that. Uh, so, again, direct fire. You think anything positioned where these markers are back here in these monuments and in, in these guns is going to be able to hit anything from where it is on the back side of the curve of the hill over here? There are going to be three sets of hands that position these things out here, battlefield monument-wise. And they have to do that because the National Park does not suddenly pop up out of the ground as a finished object. They will have to acquire the property in different stages, different pieces. And the piece of property below the Millerstown Road, east of the south trunk of West Confederate Avenue, and where it reconnects with the Emmitsburg Road out there is known as the Flattery Tract. And the Flatteries are a stubborn lot and they don't uh, sell title to the War Department until a great lot of time later. And so the placement of monuments and markers and memorials is not actually done for a great many years. So you will see a number of what I call, anybody here into fantasy football? Yep. Okay, well this is fantasy artillery. <laughs> we will not place the markers in a place that does them actual historical justice. They swear to it a little bit. That's as close as we can get, but that's all that they can do. Now I get the question from time to time, well, now that we all own it, why don't we go ahead and place them in the right spots? Well, we don't know. We can't get testimony from anybody still extant because they're not about uh, where the actual places were. We have a pretty good hunch I'll share that with you as you go through the program, but we don't, we didn't know, uh, we couldn't make it at that time, and now we can't make it now, so it would be one incorrect spot to another still somewhat incorrect spot with no uh, assurance of 100% accuracy in either case. So the memorial spots will remain as they are. But at any rate, when they bring them up uh, to this point, and remember, what you're looking at right down here is the Georgia State Memorial with the shaft right there and the two bronze guns uh, to the left of that. And that brings up an interesting topic. Remember, what is one of the main <coughs> political objectives that the Confederacy is fighting for? States' rights. States' rights. The right of a state to do as it will. And what is the primary supplier of artillery for the Confederacy? Virginia. Virginia. Could I go right more? No, 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 no. What do the Confederates capture a lot of in 1862? Oh, Napoleon. Guns. Guns, and they capture them from Yankee industry. Remember that old story, you and have as many we, uh, U.S. guns as we and have. <laughs> okay, so when the entities capture them, they are all, of course, captured by state troops. So they do not go into a collective pot that belongs to the Confederate Ordnance Department, they belong to the various states. And so they will not wind up being redistributed as a Confederate Ordnance Bureau would see fit. And this will drive the Confederate Ordnance people absolutely nuts. 
And one of the fellows that it drives nuts is William Nelson Pendleton, the fellow who actually operates uh, the Confederate Ordnance Bureau. And he will make a, a good case of that. He will write Robert E. Lee a couple of times uh, about that. And he will uh, get into this as far as the objective of reorganization goes. In February 11th, 1863, he will say the objections to the brigade batteries are obvious. Burdened as brigade and division commanders are, they can scarcely extend the batteries thus assigned that minute supervision which they require. And then he will go on to detail exactly what he means. Considerable difficulty exists between the battalions. Some have rifles in excess. The black guns would be rifling on the inside, very accurate at very long distance. Others, Napoleons, the bronze guns for the vast majority of the uh, smooth bores that are used here uh, by both sides of Gettysburg. It has been deemed a less evil to let it remain than to create other difficulties, and Pendleton can write with an astonishing vagary at times. <laughs> the serious changes of armament now in batteries and battalions that have long used certain guns must produce regrets and dissatisfaction, which, in a case like ours, requiring the whole hearts of men, it does not seem to me wise to excite. It seems to me the least evil to let the battalions remain as they are, which really means that they're not exactly the best fit units to participate the way they are, but politics is going to keep it that way. And that's what will happen in the Confederate artillery, not just here on the 2nd of July, but everywhere the Confederate artillery goes. And just a real quick example of that is that on the 3rd of July, when it's time for the bombardment, if they need the rifled guns up on a hillside to make the best of it, they'll go into every battery, pluck out the rifled guns, and slap them up on the hillside, give them a new commander for the temporary unit that they're going to create out of that, and leave all the uh, short firing range guns off somewhere else to do something else. Not the best way to do that, but that's what they do it because they're fighting for states' rights. You know, that diet of states' rights has military implications as well as political. Now, the shells that are going to go into these guns will also be a little bit less than desirable. Edward Porter Alexander will note this. He said, our artillery ammunition was inferior, especially that of the rifles. The Confederacy did not have the facilities for much nice work of that sort, and we had to take what we could get without rigid inspection. How our rifle batteries always envied the opposition in their abundant supply of splendid ammunition. For an unreliable fuse or rifle shell which tumbles sickens not only the gunner, but the whole battery, more than misfires at large game, dishearten the sportsman. There is no encouragement to careful aiming when the ammunition fails and the men feel handicapped. Now, there had been two major fires in Richmond in the spring of 1863, and that meant that they were using fuses from one factory and shell bodies from another. And that often meant that the, fuse, that the shells would either burst in the gun, burst just ahead of the gun, where the innocent cannoneers were, or maybe not burst at all by the target. When E.P. Alexander took some of this ammunition with him to Knoxville in the fall of 1863. He conducted a test. Four out of a hundred of the shells worked the way they were supposed to. <laughs> That's a success rate of four percent. Now, Alexander was becoming aware of these deficiencies, and the one way you make sure that it works is you hold the guns real close. And so that's what he was going to do come the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg. And that means that when they get ready to bring the infantry and the artillery into line out here, they were going to make a couple of technical changes. But first they have to bring everything up here. Now, when Longstreet's guys are beginning to come up this back of the hill here, of course it's going to take some time for that counter march, but Alexander is a trained engineer too. He can read a map and what he winds up doing is he's not quite as fearful of the high ground out here because he has his guys, the artillery, tumble off the side of a hill, scoot around, and the artillery begins to get into position way before the infantry does with their long march to their furthest position. And so that's what's going to happen as far as getting the artillery in position. They're still on the back of the ridge 
they still will await the assignment with their various infantry commands, but that's the way it's pretty much going to go for the uh, positioning of the artillery. Now, let's get up back into this area here. While those folks for Hood and for McClaws stay connected one to the other uh, along the line of battle. And of course, Pickett is not here yet, so Pickett's guys aren't even here yet. Major Deering is kind of floating around uh, at this point. He has no real command at this point. His guns are still on the line of march. But some of these guns are much different than others and have much different capacity. It's always intrigued me that the biggest, heftiest guns that the Confederates have don't really help start the bombardment around 2 o'clock. 20-pounder Parrot rifles, and they were the... Saturday night specials of the artillery of that era because the barrel, the main barrel unit, and that's just this part of it, is all cast iron. Cast iron doesn't work very well under pressure, so you have to put a big reinforcing wrap of wrought iron over it because black powder is not a progressive burning powder. It's all, uh, it all fires off at once, and so you have to keep this thing together with that wrought iron belt around it here. But a 20 pounder here, this thing fires a good distance, 1,750 yards. And it's one of those batteries that's kept in Alexander's uh, reserve folks. But at any rate, uh, they will position uh, a number of batteries with Hood's uh, division, a number of batteries with McClaws, and stretch them out. But again, they do not do it on the back here and alongside the roadway as the monuments and the markers here suggest. What we're gonna do is come up here, cross the stone wall, as I demonstrated to some of you earlier, and take a look at exactly how they're going to use the terrain to compensate for that short and failing ammunition that they put. Box just help you get a uh, better grip on that? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. I was wondering if you're trying to do it looking like a, uh, you know, a time appropriate iPhone photographer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hold still while we light the flash pattern. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody smile. Now, the reason I brought you out here is because I wanted you to see as we moved out into the field here and I think this is just trash right now uh, because every once in a while they have to rotate some fresh stuff for nitrate uh, protection into the into the field out here it's not a paying crop I don't suspect uh, but you can see how the field rises from the midstream and comes up like this and of course you can see a little round top on the far side here but the bowl effect that this creates going down towards the peach orchard towards the road and then rises back up and because of the failures of confederate ordnance this allows the confederate batteries to position themselves at about 600 yards or so from the federal batteries because when dan sickles moves out he moves out and the peach orchard becomes the base or the point of a V with Humphrey's division riding north along the Emmitsburg Road and Bernie's division going back along the Wheatfield Road going back in that direction. So there is a clump of artillery positioned in the center of that area reinforced with some reserve artillery, but it's primarily George Randolph's 3rd Corps artillery in the center of that area. And to try and overwhelm that, there's going to be this semicircle of two battalions under Alexander that he will pull out here. And of course, as the Confederate infantry continues to snake across that direction towards the backside of Big Round Top, that's going to catch the eye of some of the artillerists in the Peach Orchard. And about 2 o'clock they will note 
that infantry moving across there and moving infantry is a legitimate target for <coughs> artillery. And so about two o'clock, they will start firing. Clarks, New Jersey will start sending shells down in that direction, as well as the fact that Longstreet will ride up towards the intersection of Seminary Ridge and Millerstown Road near where we were, and we'll begin to pester some of the officers there. Why is not a battery placed here, Longstreet will say. And since it's an opening there, now this is one of those things, how many of you people really like Longstreet? I do. <laughs> oh, it's confessional time, okay. Uh, well, this is one of those times when, you know, Longstreet, you know, asks one of those kind of eh, questions because you don't make a target of a single visible artillery battery in 600 yards range uh, by itself. Now, Alexander will have his particular rationale for that because of the ordnance problems, but uh, General McClaws will come and say very specifically that the reason he's doing that is because that it's going to draw fire from one of the batteries in the peach orchard. And sure enough, it dies. And then that battery will be knocked out and another battery will be put in and that's one of Alexander's batteries at that point. So, <clears throat> indications are that everything begins to heat up here around two o'clock that afternoon. Shortly thereafter, the rest of Alexander's line here will begin to fire up and begin to really put pressure on those artillery batteries cresting the peach orchard on the federal side. Mm -hmm. Now just a little bit of background here for you. The folks that are commanding these artillery units out here, Henry Coulter Cabell for McClaw's Artillery Battalion. He's a lawyer, a graduate of the University of Virginia in 1842, practiced in Richmond before the war. Now a lawyer of course is a guy who is trained to interpret in multitudinous ways every single word said to them. So a <laughs> little bit of a curiosity there. Uh, Matthias Winston Henry will be the fellow commanding the Artillery of Hood's division, and while Alexander steps up and commands the entirety out here, Frank Huget, USMA class of 1860, born in Fortress Monroe in 1837, son of Benjamin Huget, and a captain of Huget's battery in June of 1861, so he is an in the roots uh, regular officer and an artillery officer to boot, so he's a good guy. Uh, for that particular role. So it's going to really begin to uh, take off with the pressures at that point. Now of course when the artillery is in that bowl, in that low spot over here, they are really going to begin to get a pounding as far as that goes. And it's here where the non-standardization of batteries in the close range and the faulty artillery uh, shells will really begin to take in and begin to do their work, but because they are close range, some of that will be compensated for and they will really begin to uh, have their effect on the Federals as they are going into that. Now, as they begin to get into it, there will be some evidence of the power that some of that has. Now, but of course they've had to overcome a good bit before they can get into that. But going back directly to the uh, to that conflict between Longstreet and McClaws. McClaws was ordered to position a battery there anyway, and it immediately drew federal fire. Uh, and the federal fire it draws is Buckland's battery, a little bit north of the intersection of the Wheatfield Road and the Emmitsburg Road. Now General Randolph, commanding the 3rd Corps Artillery, over in the Peach Orchard said, the first movement by the enemy toward attacking us about 2 p.m. was to place the battery in position near the intersection of the Fairfield and Emmitsburg roads. The enemy opened a smart artillery fire and I directed Captain Clark to silence or at least reply to this fire while I placed Ames' battery of light 12 pounders in the orchard to assist him. The enemy soon opened more batteries on the right of his first. So actually the first fire takes place on the north of the Millerstown Road going up in that direction. But there will be fire on both sides of, a, of the Millerstown Road intersection uh, at that point. Now from Clark, he will respond at this point. 
Captain Clark opened fire using shell and shrapnel at the enemy who were advancing across the Emmitsburg Road at 1,400 yards distance. So they will get fire from both uh, the ends of the line at that point. The fire of the battery drove them back to cover of the woods, talking about the infantry interference there. Later, Ames' battery comes up and is fired upon, and the Federals are ordered to reply. From that moment, our six-pounder guns poured a stream of shell and shrapnel into the Confederate batteries, along with Smith and Ames, who were also doing that. So that's Smith's battery, by the way, which is down at uh, Devil's Den. Uh, the enemy brought other batteries, at least the right section of Smith, by the way. The enemy brought other batteries into action on the left of the Emmitsburg Road. So from the peak orchard position, they're talking uh, the left of the Emmitsburg Road, meaning this area here. So Cabell's guns get into it. Uh, from that position. So pretty much what you see here, these guys in the middle of that uh, bowl begin to really fire on the uh, fire on the Federals at this particular point. Now uh, taking us from here, I want to begin to move us a little bit back out of the high grass uh, back up in that way. And again, the uh, artillery forces of the Third Corps, are commanded by the uh, Captain George E. Randolph. And you've got five batteries under the command of Randolph. You've got the 2nd New Jersey Light Artillery, six 10-pounder Parrots, Clark's Battery, 1st New York uh, Battery D, six 12-pounders, and that Captain Winslow, he fights more towards the wheat field down the hill uh, looking to the south. 4th New York, six 10-pounders, which is Captain James Smith. Again, he's at Devil's Den. Uh, fighting mostly to the south, but he does have a right section that, that can turn to the right and fire somewhat to the uh, south, uh, southwest. And the first Rhode Island battery, six 10 pounders, which is Buckland's battery, which I mentioned previously, a section is engaged over in this direction. And uh, the fourth U.S. battery, K6 12 pounders, Lieutenant Francis uh, W. Seeley. And we'll hear a little bit more of him, I think, a little bit later. Now, when the artillery, uh, the Confederate artillery in the bowl begins to get really engaged, of course they will also begin to take out not only the artillery, but they will also, of necessity, uh, take out a number of the supporting infantry that are in the Peach Orchard as well. And one of the units that will uh, note the effect on it will be the 114th Pennsylvania near the Sherfy Farm. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Bowen of the 114th commented what it was like to be in the middle of that firestorm. He said, the enemy opened on us the concentrated fire of his batteries and immediately we were in the midst of a terrible shower of shot and shell and every conceivable kind of missile which made terrible havoc among us. We had nothing to do but remain in our position, having no protection of any sort or kind and our position affording us none. We threw ourselves upon the ground and passively endured the horrible ordeal while death and destruction was being dealt us. But why do you read that quote here, Bert says? Because, of course, there is such a thing as counter-battery fire. When the batteries up there begin to say, you're going to do that to us, we're going to do that to you. And remember, the Confederate attacks are going in echelon, which means one brigade at a time coming back over here. So the infantry, along with the artillery here, has not yet moved, or in between the infantry here, between the artillery here rather, has not yet moved. And so there's going to be uh, all sorts of artillery from the Peach Orchard coming back in this direction. And the artillery report reads this way, being the first to open fire, we received for a short time the concentrated fire from the enemy's batteries. The fire from our lines and from the enemy became so incessant that it rendered necessary for us sometimes to pause and allow the smoke to clear away in order to enable the gunners to take aim. So between here and the federal line at the Peach Orchard, imagine just a giant cotton ball sitting in the middle of the field. So, you know, you hear about that in other places, but here on the second day, uh, it would be like that. Except it was a cotton ball with thorns, because according to one of the guys in the 21st Mississippi, it was fairly deadly. He said, I remember vividly the effects of the first shot that came from the battery in our front. The shell exploded in the ranks of my company near me. J.T. Worley was killed, and Captain H.H. H. Simmons, John H. Thompson, and J.T. Neely each lost a leg. 
by the same shot, there were other casualties. And J.B. Booth, of course, from Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade. So that gives you an idea of what it's like over here in the middle of that cannonade in the mid-afternoon. So we're going to come up this way here then. It's all about the ability to control your guns, especially here, because the ability to buy them on the open market plagued the Federals and the Confederates, and the Confederates with their cotton money were able to go out and buy all sorts of armaments that they needed, and that would include not only the exotic Whitworth that you'll see on the uh, Oak Hill by the Peace Light, but also these are the equivalent of the giant sawed-off shotgun sort of things that are pretty powerful uh, because these are the largest by caliber on the battlefield, 24-pounder howitzers. Uh, from Austrian manufacturer and when they fire they are howitzers they got short barrels big bores and when they fire they throw the projectiles a fair distance but they also because of the punch they uh, throw will also roll back a considerable distance and because we are on the slope of the hill here it took a considerable team of guys to trace to uh, chase the gun move it back into position and ready it for the next shot and because of that they wound up having to uh, keep men exposed working the gun for a longer period of time before it was actually ready and able to fire again and that meant that they wound up having a, uh, a higher number of casualties with that gun and they wound up having to borrow men from the uh, from Barksdale Brigade. Oh yes, we were. Are they capable of firing any sort of canister? Oh yes. Yeah, but at this distance you're still uh, primarily throwing uh, some kinds of uh, shell uh, and, uh, and case shot, things like that. And as a result, when they were done, uh, they had had to beg infantry support from Barksdale's guys and when they were done, one of the writers noted that the number of men they actually returned to Barksdale was notably smaller, and one of Barksdale's guys noted it was a small return on the investment. <laughs> effective range of these? I'm sorry? What's the effective range of these? Uh, about uh, 1,200 yards. So these, you know, they're howitzers. The, the effect of a howitzer is actually with its shorter barrel to get a uh, slightly higher apogee so as to be able to reach uh, over uh, medium obstacles. You know, gun is a flatter trajectory designed to reach very far. Mortar, of course, is very high apogee designed to reach over uh, walls and fortifications. So, and let's head up uh, a little bit. Uh, one more to the north. <laughs> now, one of the things about uh, Civil War uh, Confederate units, and sometimes with Federal units as well, they had multiple names. And every so often as well, you would have officers that would come in, be reassigned, things like this. There was a fellow with uh, Gilbert's Battery here, also known as the uh, Retz Battalion. These guys here from uh, South Carolina and as they were put in position you can see the Shurfy barn you can see how close we are at this particular position they'd actually again this is designed for memorialization so they're right by the road I suspect they were actually some distance closer uh, at that point which of course made them closer in the sights of the Federals who had better ammunition than the Confederates did and uh, according to uh, one of Alexander's uh, notations here this new officer recently elected to be a lieutenant in Gilbert's battery had arrived from Charleston. He had never served with artillery before and being new, asked me to let him look on for a few days to learn the ropes before going on regular duty. I consented and assured him that there would be plenty of time. The next afternoon was the 2nd of July. I saw him standing behind a little sapling and looking at the federal batteries only about 500 yards off 
knocking his battery to pieces around him as badly and as fast as I ever saw it done in my life. He stuck to it until it was over, but finally concluded that he did not fancy the artillery and returned to his old cavalry unit in South Carolina. <laughs> now, how many of us are familiar with the story of the 9th Massachusetts and the story of those six guns in the corner as they're told McGilvery's reserve guns trying to hold on the corner as the Confederates push down and they've been given the order that they are not to withdraw and they face the Confederate infantry and wind up losing a tremendous amount of men and horses. It's the 80 horses of the battery that you see in that picture uh, next to the barn uh, where you see that one bullet hole, where you see that one cannonball hole uh, and you still see that cannonball hole today uh, in the barn where the Confederates uh, were eventually able to force after a severe fight because these guys will eventually go into fight by prolong in the whole nine yards uh, to do that but there's an interesting note that Alexander makes about that uh, because he says here Gilbert's battery of four guns had two fairly struck by the enemy shot and dismounted in other words enough force to pop the barrel off of the carriage of less than 75 men in action he had 40 killed and wounded an unusual proportion of the wounds, too, were noted by the surgeon as severe. And here's where uh, Alexander makes the comment. General Hunt, Meade's chief of artillery, specifically writes about the 9th Massachusetts Battery, which sacrificed itself for the safety of the line. It lost 37 of 104, partly in that hand-to-hand -hand fight with infantry, which are the Mississippians who will come over the hill into it. But Gilbert's were almost all by artillery fire. So long range, we're getting better at technology and killing people at long distance. Uh, still crude, but uh, getting better at it. However, the artillery line north of the Millerstown Road and south of the Millerstown Road at this close distance does have its effect. For example, Buckland's battery, which is north of the Sherfy barn uh, and north of the uh, uh, Sherfy farm on the Emmitsburg Road. Uh, will have its effect uh, in doing a similar job. 28 killed or wounded, one man missing, 40 horses killed, one third of their total, and they had to abandon one caisson, which is an artillery ammunition wagon with three uh, boxes of ammunition on it. Lieutenant Buckland had three horses shot out from under him. He received a chest wound from a shrapnel ball as the battery withdrew, and a shrapnel ball looks roughly like a lead marble. It's the difference between a shrapnel ball and a canister ball. If you go just a ball about the size of your thumb, that would be a shrapnel ball, also a canister ball in a three inch ordnance rifle, which we haven't talked about yet, but a canister ball in a Napoleon, a bronze gun, uh, would look about like this. And so that's some of the things that fly out of these things, you know, give you a good idea just uh, visibly as to what we're dealing with as opposed to the big full-size shells uh, here. Lieutenant Buckland will write to Colonel Batchelder, the official Gettysburg historian, in December of 1863, my battery is torn and shattered and my brave boys have gone never to return. Curse the Rebs. So this is going to be remembered as a pretty vicious uh, sort of phase of the fight in through here. This idea that Alexander has to push in to close the gap is proving to be very effective. But at what cost? Because it's chewing up his forces as well. Now, let's go back in this direction here a little bit back towards the intersection. Now the Millerstown Road coming up here is going to be of some consequence because it's from the Millerstown Road on the right that, remember that big 20-pounder that was by the, actually the section, the two guns, the big two 20-pounder uh, parrot rifles that were back by the tower. 
Wolf Hawks and Jordan's batteries are back on the slope, back around this area here. They are the reserves that have not actually been brought into the fight yet. Along with them is Parker's battery, Parker's Virginia battery. And from the account detailing the history of Parker's battery, on the slope of a wooded hill, our infantry were forming for a charge. Federal infantry were thick in front of them, assisted by artillery, which poured a storm of shrapnel into our ranks. Rhett's battery was already blazing away from the crest of the hill, and they were said to have lost 30 men in as many minutes, but we are as yet at its base. Cannoneers, mount forward. Quickly we rushed between the already moving wheels and nimbly sprang into our seats, all except John Hightower, who missed his hold, and the great heavyweight rolled over his body. Did we halt? No, this is the grim discipline of war. Never shall I forget the scene presented on this hill. Federal shrapnel rattled like hail through the trees around us. There is an awful pause. One of our men trembles and cowers. Like lightning, Parker's sword circles over the coward's head, and he learns that there is danger in rear as well as in front. <laughs> Captain Parker was a, do was a uh, doctor born in Port Royal, Virginia in 1824. He was promoted captain of the battery in the spring of 1862. So they're continuing their work. And as they do so, the Mississippians will finally get that word to begin their assault. The Mississippians uh, being the infantry uh, that's finally moving up through this here. Remember, it's a brigade by brigade attack as they come up through here. As Longstreet's brigades came into action, the roar of the cannon, this is uh, George Clark of Wilcox's brigade here. The roar of the cannon was accompanied by the rattle of musketry mingled with the yells of our boys as they moved forward on the rod. As the fire and clamor approached, Marksdale threw his Mississippians forward in an unbroken line. Now across the way, artillery batteries down there in the reserve just like those guys were at the bottom of the hill so kind of keep all that in your mind as we get ready to see the scene we're going to see and don't worry if anybody at home this is park service and abandoned oh, it's abandoned yeah they didn't pay the rent so we see <laughs> that. Actually, do employees does it do employees live in it or? no nobody lives in it it's usually used as a staging area when we have an event oh okay that's why we don't bother to paint it or anything else like that. Now one thing that's really neat from this position and even a little more so from further in but I'm not about to wade into all of that with all the potential bugs and whatnot there. <laughs> Is the guys in the uh, in the peach orchard? Oh, a covering fire. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's the 11 o'clock. Uh, the guys in the peach orchard, from their higher position there, are beginning to waver pretty badly. But they're still holding the ground for a time. The guy from the 2nd New Hampshire Infantry observes, Then came the storm. Every rebel gun was let loose until the peach orchard seemed to be almost moving in the windage of hurtling metal. I love that. Under cover of this tremendous fire, the final decisive assault was made by Barksdale, who will swing down through this area here. And of course, as he comes down through here, the Georgians of William T. Wofford are getting ready to follow on his flank. Formed in mass line of battle, his troops swept steadily forward. And 
the Mississippians will come down through here and they will begin to ascend up in that direction. And of course, when they hit, it's going to be interesting to see how they hit because the peach orchard is slightly askew. And so there will actually be two fronts presented to the Confederates as they come up there. And one will come slightly that way and one will come slightly that way. But both of them will kind of hit and push right into the peach orchard proper. So we're going to continue coming up this way. We do have a little bit of a drainage ditch up here ahead, so please be cognizant of that. I found it interesting. I'll go for the You'll have uh, a little bit of the see a monument there for uh, Sealy's battery and uh, Randolph's battery right up to there. And those were the two others that are part of the 3rd Corps Artillery Defense and the Reserve Artillery Defense that are part of that that play across uh, into what's firing, firing from Alexander's folks. But here, again, the Peach Orchard, and you will see on occasion, you will see artillery that's facing to the west. You will also see artillery that is facing to the south. Mm -hmm. and this is what they've had to do to split their defense to try and hold on to this badly positioned Union display of Sicklesdom. <laughs> but with all of the Confederates that are coming up, brigade by brigade by brigade by brigade, all of these Mississippians, and really the roof over here, get ready carefully to cross the road here in just a moment. And then we'll resume the call. Yes. Captain Moran of the 73rd New York of the Excelsior Brigade described the retreat of the Union guns. Of course, the infantry falls back first. It's more mobile and more inspired to do so. But uh, it says a glance to the left at that moment revealed a thrilling battle picture. The shattered line was retreating in separated streams, artillerists heroically clinging to their still smoking guns and brave little infantry squads assisting them with their endangered cannon over the soft ground. The positions of these batteries showed broken carriages, caissons, and wheels, while scores of slain horses and men laid across each other in mangled and ghastly heaps. And that gives you an idea of what's going on, because as soon as the Mississippians and Barksdale's folks hit the center left of this and proceeded up in that direction towards the center of the field, the Georgians will come up almost at their flank and continue on with the pressure but the Mississippians at this point are really chewing into it as they really hit the orchard here Moran continued showers of branches fell from the peach trees in their leaden hurricane that swept it from two sides couriers and aides dashed right and left with orders officers brandished swords and pistols and shouted commands which could not be heard 20 feet away our color bearer was struck dead a brave man instantly caught up the flag and waved it defiantly. A bullet shattered his arm and the third man held it up. A rebel infantry ordered, entered the orchard and we received their fire almost in our backs. Because of the odd positioning of the orchard versus where the Confederates were coming in, that's the way it went. But the instinct was either hold with all your might or flee with all your speed. That was one of the two things that took a hold. And of course, Wofford and his Georgia infantry would come up a little more. Wofford of Georgia, his hat off and his bald head shining in the sun, dashes through our battery followed by his brigade. Out flashed Captain Parker's sword, while the words hurrah for you of the bald head, apparently a feature of his person, uh, issued instantly from his lips. It was repeated by the cannoneers while the charging Georgians swept down the hillside, driving the retreating foe to the opposite hill. And of course, with the infantry well advanced out here and beginning to anchor this position, it was time for the rest of the line to move forward. And they would begin to gather up all of their artillery accoutrements and begin to do just that. So Alexander begins to look to his line 
back along where we left it, along that semicircle. Just before the enemy ceased his fire, annoyed by his obstinacy, I had ordered up my two remaining batteries, T.C. Jordan and P. Woolfolk, remember those big heavy guns. These arriving on the ground just as the infantry charge was made, joined in it under immediate command of Major James Deering. Major Huget also followed with the four batteries under his control as soon as the teams could be disencumbered of killed and wounded animals, for their loss had been serious. Now, what I want us to do is try and find a good spot right in here, because as you look across this field, mm. you know, that whole slope, and with the numbers of people we had, I didn't want to do it uh, <coughs> right there by the road, because safety was going to be concerned of mine. But if you can get right into this area and just look, imagine that whole field that you saw as you were coming up with the line from the middle of the field all the way to the road of just nothing but horse assisted artillery pieces. Alexander would do this. Every battery was limbered up to the front and the two batteries from the rear coming up, all six charged in line across the plain and went into action. I can recall no more splendid sight on a small scale and no more inspiriting moment during the war than that of the charge of these six batteries. An artillerist heaven is to follow the routed enemy after a tough resistance and throw shells and canister into his disorganized and fleeing masses. Then the explosion of the guns sound louder and more powerful and the very shouts of the gunners ordering fire in rapid succession thrill one's very soul. There is no excitement on earth like it. It is far prettier shooting than at a compact, narrow line of battle or at another battery. Now we saw our heaven just in front and were already breathing the very air of victory. Now we would have our revenge and make them sorry they had stayed so long. Now if you look over in this direction, you will see what he was talking about or what he thought he was talking about because if you look right in this way, you will see Cemetery Ridge. Problem. And that problem is this. He continues his writing at one point saying, when I got to take in all the topography, I was very much disappointed. It was not the enemy's main line we had broken. That loomed up near a thousand yards beyond us, a ridge giving good cover behind it and endless fine positions for batteries. And batteries in abundance were showing up Troops, too, seemed to be marching and fighting everywhere. There was plenty to shoot at. One could take his choice, and here my gun stood and fired until it was too dark to see anything more, and both sides were glad to stop and rest. Now, he will later ride back for Cabell's guns, but they, too, had lost too many horses. It was evident that we had not finished the job and would have to make a fresh start in the morning. Now the folks that would be active here would continue to do that and it was reported that one of the gunners out here said, oh captain this is beautiful, said one of our sentimental soldiers. <laughs> but since all of those folks had been driven back to a higher, more compact position as far as the numbers of men in place, the Confederates realized that they would have to strike again. And from Robert E. Lee's report comes the following. The result of this day's operations induced the belief that with proper concert of action, there's that fatal phrase, and with the increased support that the positions on the right, meaning the peach orchard here, would enable the artillery to render the assaulting columns, meaning picket. We should ultimately succeed. It was accordingly determined to continue the attack. A careful examination was made of the ground secured by Longstreet and his batteries placed in positions which, it was believed, would enable them to silence those of the enemy. And thus, with a sacrificial and sacrificial success, 
on the second was planted the seed of a sacrificial failure on the third. That concludes my program for you today. If you have any questions, any comments, you're welcome to stick around.